Campfire Classics is a classic literature podcast. However, your hosts will occasionally use not-so-classy language and immature humor to describe very mature situations. As such, listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Ken Sandberg. And I'm Craig Kelberg. Welcome to Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. If you have a bookshelf. Yeah, I suppose that is sort of, um, our tagline really speaks from a place of privilege, doesn't it? It does. Not everyone has a bookshelf. Mm -hmm. Or books. Or can see. True. Well, I feel bad about myself now. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for, well, this was it, folks. It was a good run. This is the end. No more podcasts. We have been canceled just like that. Woof. Man, I I always knew it was going to happen, but I expected it to be because of some joke we told in the middle yeah. of an episode, not because my brother came on board and poked holes in the very conceit of the show. I, yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a good run. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> Thank you, listener. Have a good night. Uh, well, I think we should at the very least finish recording this one and um. like let... Let, let them turn it off. Yeah, let the, well, let the, 30 let, seconds the, in. let the problematic nature of the podcast get out to people. Right. Like, I think we owe that to our listeners who have been loyal thus far. Like, we can't just stop it here. We need to, we need to push through and let them cancel us. Perfect. Right? That, that'll make them feel better about themselves for not listening to the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, like, that way they can, like, we can be the target of their 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 outcry right of like how could you assume everybody has a shelf right yeah i had a dream it would end this way did you no oh that just seemed like the thing to say i was kind of hoping that you would say yes (laughs) and then i could force you to make up the dream on the spot but so moving on yep uh what's up listeners how you doing has it been a good week Are you a good week or a bad week? I'm not a week at all. I'm a strong. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's idiotic. Yeah. Yeah. Last week, uh, we got to read an email from a uh from a regular listener Lindsay, um one of our super fans one of our longtime fans uh and she sent us a message about her creepy ass possibly haunted doll named freddy oh, uh awesome. which i uh i shared here i posted pictures of freddy online people have responded they agree that he is certainly creepy if not haunted uh, and I invited listeners to, um, send in pictures of other possibly haunted things or certainly creepy things that, uh, that they have in their house. So this week, uh, a thank you to Jan Lawler, Heather's mom for submitting this haunted, creepy object. Uh, she sent us a picture of that lives in their home. That's horrifying. So this picture will be shared on our Instagram. Uh, much like last week, I'll post it as soon after the episode drops as I possibly can. It's like a Victorian chef clown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this this is the information that accompanied that picture. So from from Jan. Here's a picture of Mambo the Clown. When I was growing up, there was an afternoon show on a local network called Dr. Max and Mambo. We used to watch it after school all the time, and they even did a performance at our church. My parents saw this painting at some point and thought it would be a nice reminder of the show. When Heather was born, we hung it in her room, thinking it was appropriate. At some point, Heather told us it terrified her, so we obviously removed it. We still own it but never hang it in our house. We have actually thought of trying to find a place in Cedar Rapids that might want it as a museum piece to remind the people of the show, but we haven't done it yet. So, Craig, what do you think? Haunted, creepy, or just fine? Definitely creepy. 
Um, but also just fine. Creepy, but just fine. Yeah. Can you explain? Uh, I, I don't think creepy is inherently bad. Okay. So I am pro, I, I'm not sure exactly where the delineation between creepy and fine is, but, uh, I would hang it in my house. Where? Above my child's bed. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's not true. Um, I don't think I would We have written confirmation (laughs) that that is a bad idea. I don't think I'd be allowed to hang it in my house, honestly. Okay, so if you had this painting, what would you do with it? Maybe I would put it in front of uh, the tip jar at shows. Ooh, I like that. Stage ornamentation, I think. Like they could be... Yeah. Yeah. In front of the tip jar? Not like... Or next... Like not, not like behind you? It's your permanent backdrop? Depends on how big it is. Can you blow it up to like... 12 feet by 20 feet. Yeah. I mean, if I could get like a giant <laughs> banner of, of, of Mambo, Mambo the clown, it'd be good. Would you be worried about stepping on insane clown posse's IP by hanging a giant clown banner behind you? That clown looks perfectly sane. <laughs> so I think we're good. I'm not going to say perfectly sane. Um, I'm not worried. (laughs) All right, listener. Well, uh, y'all heard it here. My brother is braver than me. So when uh, when I share this picture to social media, it'll probably be up uh, sometime late on Tuesday or early on Wednesday, um, just depending on when I get around to it. You will have to let us know what you think of Mambo the Clown. Are you worried? Is it creepy? Is it haunted? Or is it just fine? I know a lot of people take issues with clowns generally, but um, I don't know. Not all clowns are bad. Just the creepy ones. Not all clowns. Not all clowns. (laughs) (laughs) But only clowns. Yeah. What are your feelings on clowns? I like the the standard clown. Mm -hmm. I kind of find boring. I don't find them scary or creepy. All right. But I'm not particularly entertained by them. I have I have actually a couple friends who like do the clown thing have, are like trained clowns, but they don't do the like traditional clown outfit. No. Oh. All right. Um, they've kind of. Uh, like one of my friends actually just just went to like a big uh, summer clown camp thing. So, so like he, he does a lot of that stuff, but he dresses uh, all in black and like oh. a. Good goth clown. Yeah, yeah. That's not more creepy. Uh, shout out to Toy Box, America's favorite cartoon witch. That's his tagline. Uh, great. Um, I'll. Uh, does Does he have a website or something? Yes. Cool. It'll be in the episode <laughs> doobly do thing. Great. Uh, so that is Mambo the Clown and uh, Haunted, Creepy, or Just Fine. Uh, please, listeners, write in to 5050artsproduction at gmail.com to let us know if you think this clown is perfectly safe. And please send us any uh, haunted or creepy items that you have in your life so that we can share those and make other people afraid of them, too. Ooh. But this is not a clown podcast, nor is it a creepy ass haunted doll podcast. It is, in fact, a literature comedy podcast or something like that, where, as our problematic tagline states, we do attempt to read books, short stories, really, uh, that we find from the public domain. We cold read them here for your listening. Meh. And... (laughs) Make fun of outdated language and unexpected penis jokes that come from yesteryear. Uh, But before we get to the story every week, we like to share some fun facts, give you a little bit of background information on the story, typically information about the author, which is what I'm going to do right now. Fun facts. Okay, uh, so there's not 
a ton of information uh, on on this week's fun facts, so this will be a little bit of a quick one. Uh, West Bob Holland was an American newspaper man born in Goldsboro, North Carolina in 1868. He worked as a reporter in Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, Denver, and Philadelphia before joining the staff of New York World in 1895. Presumably in New York. Presumably in New York, uh, although I suppose it could be in, like, York, Pennsylvania, and it's the new uh. York world. <laughs> I hope that's what it is. In 1898, he established the Daily Record in Durham, North Carolina. His literary contributions predominantly include collecting ghost stories, most successfully into a book called... 25 ghost stories mm. real creative right yeah i wonder where we got that title uh the book includes stories from a couple of previous campfire classics authors including edgar Allan poe and guy de montpesson I've, I've heard of uh, edgar Allan poe yeah uh montpesson is a french guy who wrote a story about a necklace that we read on the podcast that sounds kind of familiar yeah uh the last few stories in the collection are credited to an author named q e d but occasionally they are also credited to Mr. Holland himself. So possibly he is the author or maybe not. We're not really sure. Perfect. QED is an abbreviation of a Latin phrase, which means which was to be demonstrated. Okay. Um, maybe he meant that to be clever. I don't know. Or maybe it was someone else. Maybe it was a guy named Quincy Edward Davidson. Yes. Or Quixote El Don. El Don. <laughs> Quixote El Don. I like it. <laughs> Stories by Don Quixote. Yep. Uh, regardless, uh, Bob W. Bob Holland uh, died in June 1932, and that is pretty much everything we know about him. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so today you'll be reading a story that was written or at the very least carefully selected by Mr. W. Bob Holland called A Fight with a Ghost. Ooh, I love ghost stories. Right? Yeah. They're a lot of fun. All right. Let's start this fire. A Fight with a Ghost by QED, probably W. Bob Holland. Probably. That was my edit. Yeah. I figured that was. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> in, in his, in his in own Bob book. Holland's collection, he writes, probably me. me. I don't know. Maybe. Right. <clears throat> that really defeats the purpose of having an anonymous pseudonym. <laughs> All right. That'd be like Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Maybe? Maybe Samuel Clemens. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> no, I never believed much in ghosts, said the doctor. But I was always rather afraid of them. Um. Keskla fuck? Hmm. Have you ever seen one? Asked one of the other men. I assume not, given the Since fact he that doesn't he doesn't believe, believe in them. them. But he is afraid of them. <sighs> so. Doctors. This is a man holding conflicting beliefs. The doctor took his cigar out of his mouth. Oh, I read that first line wrong then. No, I never believed much in ghosts. <laughs> yeah. All right. Doctor took his cigar out of his mouth and contemplated the ash for a moment or two before replying. I have had some rather startling experiences, he said. After a pause, during which the rest of us exchanged glances, for the doctor has seen many things and is not averse to talking about them in congenial company. Would you care about hearing one of them? It gives me the cold shivers now to speak of it. We nodded, and the doctor, taking a sip as an antidote to the shivers, began. So in my head, our narrator came to his doctor's appointment. <laughs> <laughs> And now in the middle of his, like, colonoscopy, 
this well, doctor is about to tell a ghost While smoking story. a cigar smoking and a having cigar. a drink. <sighs> Say, ah, let me tell you a ghost story, kid. It's canon. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right. You remember George Carson, who played for the varsity some years ago. Big chap with a light mustache. Well, I saw a good deal of him before he married, while he was reading for the bar in town. It was just after he became engaged to Miss Stoner. I'm going to say Stoner. I like that. (laughs) Yeah, it looks like Stoner to me. It was just after he became engaged to Miss Stoner, who is now Mrs. Carson. So presumably they got married. Yeah. That he asked me to go down to a place which his people had taken in the country. Either they got married or she is very confident. Yeah. Yeah. It's also possible that, like, she married his brother. Yeah. Or his dad. Or she just decided to go by Mrs. Carson because she assumed that they would get married. Yeah. Miss Stoner was to be there and he wanted me to meet her. I could not go down for Christmas Day as I had promised to be with my people. Mm. But... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when when they say my people, your people, they mean my family, your family. I know. <laughs> I know. Not getting canceled for that one, folks. <laughs> but as I had been working a bit too hard and wanted a few days rest, I decided to run down for a few days about the new year. Woodcote was a pleasant enough place to look at. There were two packs of hounds within easy distance, and it was far enough from a station to cut you off completely from the morning papers. The Carsons had been lucky, I thought, in coming across such a good house at such a moderate figure. For, as George told me, the owner had been obliged to go abroad for his health, and was anxious not to leave the place empty all the winter. It was an old house with big gables and preposterous corners. <laughs> preposterous. Preposterous all corners. All over the place. So none of them are at right angles. <laughs> none all of them of are... the rooms are like octagons. Yeah. Or just diamonds. Acute triangles. Yep. Or it's just a maze. Um... Lost it. Uh, preposterous corners all over the place, and you couldn't walk ten paces along any of the passages without tumbling up or down stairs. So it is a maze. That's awesome. I want to live in this place. (laughs) But it had been patched from time to time, and, among other improvements, a big billiard room had been built out, uh, out at the back. There were a lot of bees. A big billiard room had been built out at the back. Told you you should have done your vocal warm ups. A country house in the winter without a billiard room, when the frost stops hunting, is just, well, not even a gilded prison. (laughs) (laughs) I think this guy's wealthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you familiar with the Winchester house? That sounds familiar. It's, It's this house that was, like, built purposely to be confusing there are like stairways that go to nowhere and doors that look like they open into another room but they just open into a wall six inches away Mm -hmm. um and it's it supposedly it is both to confuse like robbers and ghosts that's awesome i want it yeah it's in uh i think san jose it's in california somewhere i've always if i came into like an uh, like just a disgustingly large amount of money and I couldn't just, you know, give it away to a good cause. I've I've always thought that like the thing that I would spend my money on building a house, like the dream house, would be to hire an architect to put in secret passageways but not tell me so that I could spend the rest of my life not knowing if I had found any, or found all of them. So life would always be a mystery in Ooh. that house. Ooh, I like that. Right? I like that. And kind of kind of have him be like, okay, like I want varying degrees of of like difficult to find. Like, you know, there should be a bookshelf that just pulls open, but there should also be something where like you have to push in this like particular stone in the wall to un- unlatch. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um I want at least 3 fireplaces so I don't know which one has 
right. a room hidden behind it. Yeah. Um, one of the passageways should only be discoverable when you realize there's a hollow floorboard underneath the carpet, so you have to pull that up. Right. To- yeah. I think that'd be great. That's my dream house. I like it. I've always <laughs> thought it would be really fun if I ever owned a house to basically do that before selling it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just create false walls with little things hidden. Um, yeah. It'd be fun. And obviously um, a, a billiard room because anything less would just be a gilded prison. Would be less than a gilded less prison. Less than a gilded prison. Yeah. So <laughs> bringing it back around. All right. Not even a gilded prison wouldn't have a billiard room. <clears throat> the party was a small one. Besides George and his father and mother, there were only a couple of Mrs. Carson, who, being somewhere in the early teens, didn't count, and Miss Stoner, who, of course, counted a good deal, and lastly, myself. Miss Stoner ought to have been happy, for George Carson, besides being an excellent fellow all around, was by no means a bad match, being an only son with considerable expectations. But somehow or other, she did not strike me as looking either very well or very happy. She gave me the impression of having something on her mind, which made her alternately nervous and listless. Ah, yes, because a thinking woman cannot be a happy woman. I mean, I don't disagree with that, but that's because I think a thinking person can't be a happy person. It's not specific to, like, I'm eternally unhappy, and I think that's largely because I, think, I think too much. Yeah. George, I fancied, noticed it and was puzzled by it, for I caught him several times watching her with an anxious and inquiring look. But, as I was not there as a doctor, of course it was no business of mine, though I discovered the reason before I left Woodcote. The second night after my arrival, we had been playing, I remember, a family pool. The rest had gone upstairs to bed. George and I adjourned to a sort of study, which he had arranged upstairs for final smoke and chat before turning in. The study was next to his bedroom and parted off from it by curtains. As we were settling down, I missed my pipe and remembered that I had laid it down in the billiard room. On principle, I never smoke another man's pipe. So. <laughs> this guy doesn't smoke a lot of weed. Um, well. <laughs> or he just always uses his own pipe. Maybe. Besides, uh, you should always get consent before you smoke another man's pipe. That's. It is a penis joke. <laughs> Great. Ah, right. They all can be. <laughs> I also, was I the only one who, when he said, I missed my pipe, immediately thought he brought it to his mouth and they just like, oh, <laughs> shit, missed. <laughs> I, I poked himself in the eye with his pipe. That is not where my mind went, but that's good. I like that. Uh, on principle, I never smoke another man's pipe. So I lit a candle, the house being in darkness, and started away in search of my own. The house looked awfully weird by the flickering light of a solitary candle. Weird is a really good descriptor when when you're writing. Yeah. It tells you a lot. Yeah. Lots of detail there. And the stairs creaked in a particularly gruesome way behind me. That's better language. That's better language. Just for all the world as though someone were following at my heels. I found my pipe where I had expected in the billiard room and came back in perhaps a little more hurry than was absolutely necessary. (laughs) Which perhaps explains why I stumbled in the uncertain light over a couple of unforeseen stairs and dropped my candle. Of course, it went out. But after a little groping, I found it. Having no matches with me, I was obliged to feel my way along the banisters, for it was so dark that I could not see my hand in front of my face. Are you sure it was so dark that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face? Or was your hand just blocking your eyes? I'm not sure. He seemed pretty sure. He seemed pretty sure. But he's a doctor who doesn't know if he believes in ghosts. It's true. So... And as I slowly advanced, sliding my hand along the broad balustrade at my side, 
it suddenly slid over something cold and clammy, which was not balustrade at all. <laughs> for stopping dead and closing my fingers round it for an instant, I felt that I was holding another hand, a skinny, bony hand, which writhed itself slowly from my grasp. And though I could hear nothing and see nothing, I was yet conscious that something was brushing past me and going up the stairs. Hi, what's that? Who are you? I called. There was no answer. I admit that I was in a regular funk. Time funk you. I must have shown it in my face. What's the matter? asked George as I blundered into his study. Oh, nothing, I answered. Dropped my candle and lost the way. But who were you talking to? I was only swearing at the candle, I replied. Oh, I thought perhaps you had seen somebody, replied George. That's cryptic. Mm. Somehow, I did not like to tell him the truth, for fear he would laugh at my nervousness. But I determined to keep an eye on my liver and take a couple of weeks' complete rest. He's going to stop drinking. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, took me a minute to get there, too. <laughs> keep an eye on my liver so it doesn't run away. That night, I woke up several times with the feeling of that confounded hand under my own, a clammy hand, which writhed as my fingers closed upon it. The next morning, after breakfast, I was in the billiard room practicing strokes while Carson was over at the stables. Presently, the door opened, and Miss Stoner looked in. Come in, I said. George will be back from the stables in a few minutes. Meanwhile, we can have 50 up. Play a game, I assume? I'm a guess. Maybe bet $50 on the game? That would be a lot of money to be betting on a game based on when this was written. 50 cents, maybe. It's also, um... Are we in England? No. I don't... Well, I mean, it didn't say, but based on... Uh... Based on the author not being from England, I assume we're... I've just been assuming we're... In the States. Yeah. Uh, also, it's worth acknowledging for our listeners who are a little quicker on the draw than uh, either you or I were. Yes, yes, I did hear practicing my strokes in the billiard room and went to a masturbation joke. I just decided to let it slide in favor of the um, continuity of the paragraph. I did not hear that because I am a good Christian boy. And Christians don't masturbate? Uh, I the only thing I can find of 50 up is uh, clubs for people who are 50 and over. All right. Well, I'm going to say it's that, he, he, you know, whether he's asking if they want to bet on the game or not, he's asking if she wants to play. Yeah. And based on the next sentence, it looks like it's irrelevant anyways. <laughs> I wanted to speak to you, she said. She was looking very tired and ill, and I began to think I should not have an uninterrupted holiday after all. Do you believe in ghosts? she asked. Having closed the door and come up to the table, where she stood leaning with both hands upon it. No, I replied, missing an easy carom, as I remembered my experience of the la- of last night. Carom? A uh, uh, billiard shot. Okay. But I believe in fancy. And supposing, then, that a person fancied he saw things, is there any remedy? What do you mean, Miss Stoner? I replied, looking at her in some surprise. Do you mean that you fancy... I stopped, for Miss Stoner turned away, sat down on one of the easy chairs by the wall, and burst into tears. Oh, please help me, she sobbed. I believe I am going mad. I laid down my cue and went over to her. Look here, Miss Stoner, I said, taking her hand, which was hot and feverish. I am a doctor and a friend of George. Now tell me all about it, and I'll do my best to set it right. 
She was in a more or less hysterical condition, and her words were freely punctuated by sobs. But gradually, I managed to elicit from her that nearly every night since she came to Woodcote, she had been awakened in some mysterious way, and had seen a horrible face looking at her from over the top of a screen which stood by the door of her bedroom, not a computer screen. No. <laughs> that would be weirdly prophetic. Yeah. As soon as she moved, the face disappeared, which convinced her that the apparition existed only in her imagination. That seemed to distress her even more than if she had believed it had believed it to be a genuine ghost, for she thought her brain was giving way. No, it's just Santa Claus. Mm. He's ho, ho, hanging ho. out. It's just after Christmas and mm. he got bored and decided to hang out. Oh! <gasps> Do you have strong feelings about the upcoming series, The Santa Clauses, starring Tim Allen as a sequel to his great movie franchise? Here's, here's the thing about that, right? I remember seeing one thing about that, and until you brought it up again, I kind of thought I just dreamed it. No, <laughs> it's very real. Oh, it is very real. They got a bunch of people back. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, David Crummeltz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Bern, Bern, Bernard? Bernard? Bernard, yeah. He's back. Um, I think they got, like, one of the Manning brothers in as someone that Tim Allen is interviewing to possibly be the new Santa Claus. Interesting. Which strikes me as weird because the movies have established that the way you pick a new Santa Claus is by murdering the old Santa Claus. I mean, it's established that if you murder the old Santa Claus and put on the outfit, then you are the new Santa Claus. It didn't necessarily establish that that's the only way it happens. I don't think. I don't know. It's been too long. Mm -hmm. I just feel like this sort of... I'm, I'm sure that... A production like this is going to be completely free of any plot holes. That's probably true. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure. <laughs> I have absolute faith in the people who decided this would be a good idea. <laughs> All right. <laughs> At the same time, they decided it would be a good idea to relaunch Quantum Leap. Really? Yep. That's actually started airing already. I can see that maybe being a good thing. We'll see. As long as they get Scott Bakula back again, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. For the same part? That's going to happen. Perfect. I told her that she was only suffering from a very common symptom of nervous disorder, as indeed it was, and promised to send a groom into the village to get a prescription made up for her. And having made me promise to breathe no word to anyone on the subject, more especially to George, she went away relieved. Nevertheless... I was not quite certain that I had made a correct diagnosis of the case. You see, I had been rather upset myself not many hours before. George was longer than I expected at the stable, and I was going to find him when at the door I met Mrs. Carson. So this would be George Carson's mom? I assume not his wife. Since he shouldn't be married yet. Correct. Yeah, I'm guessing mom. Mrs. Carson hasn't lived here for 50 years. <laughs> Ooh, that'd be a good ending. Can you spare me one moment? She said as I held open the door for her. I wanted to find you alone. <laughs> Certainly, Mrs. Carson, with I pleasure. I was just practicing my strokes. <laughs> with pleasure. An hour, if you wish. <laughs> brag much <laughs> it is so convenient you know to have a doctor in the house she said with a nervous laugh <laughs> now i want you to prescribe me a sleeping draft my nerves are rather out of order and i don't sleep as i should ah i said do you see faces and such things when you wake how do you know she asked quickly Oh, I inferred from the other symptoms. <laughs> I, er, um, lucky guess. I just assumed that anyone who's sick sees faces. 
Well, you're a woman. (laughs) I inferred from the other symptoms. We doctors have to observe all kinds of little things. Well, of course, I know it is only fancy, but it is just as bad as if it were real. I assure you it is a... Making it, it is making me quite ill, and I didn't like to mention it to Mr. Carson or to George. They would think I was losing my mind. I gave Mrs. Carson the same prescription as I had written for Miss Stoner, though by that time the conviction had grown upon me that there was something wrong which could not be cured by medicine. However, I decided to say nothing to George about the matter at present, and apparently let these people start taking drugs that they didn't need and that he didn't think they needed. Yeah. I'm more and more thinking this is not the best doctor. (laughs) In the middle of a prostate exam, smoking a cigar, (laughs) drinking his whiskey, and telling ghost stories. (sighs) For I could hardly utilize the confidence which had been placed in me by Miss Stoner and Mrs. Carson, and my own experience of the night before would scarcely have appeared convincing to him. But I determined that on the next day, which was Sunday, the Lord's Day, I would <laughs> I would invent an... Ex- it didn't say the Lord's Day. I added that. I'm sorry, I am improvising. It's okay. This story is in public domain, which means no one can come after you for changing it. It's canon. Sunday, the Lord's Day. I would invent an excuse for staying at home from church and make some explorations in the house. He's lying about not going to church. This dude is going to hell. We have established he is not a good Christian, Mm -hmm. and so practicing his strokes is absolutely fine. Oh, perfect. There was obviously some mystery at work which wanted clearing up. Mm. We all sat up rather late that night. There seemed to be a general disinclination to go to bed. We stayed all together in the billiard room until nearly midnight, and then loitered about in the hall, talking in an aimless sort of fashion. But at last, Mrs. Carson said good night with a confidential nod to me, and Miss Stoner murmured, So many thanks, I've got it. And they both went upstairs. George and I parted in the corridor above. Our rooms were opposite each other. I did not begin undressing at once, but sat down and tried to piece together some theory to account for the uncanniness of things. But the more I thought, the more perplexing it became. There was no doubt, whatever, that I had put my hand on something extremely alive and extremely unpleasant the night before. The... (laughs) The bare recollection of it made me shudder. What living thing could possibly be creeping about the house in the dark? It was a man's hand. Of that I was certain from the size of it. George Carson was out of the question, for he was in his room all the time. Playing video games. On his computer screen? Yes. Nor was it likely that Mr. Carson, Sr., would steal about his own house in his socks and refuse to answer when spoken to. The only other man in the house was an eminently respectable-looking butler, and his hand, as I had noted particularly when he poured out my wine at dinner, was plump and soft. Mm. Whereas the mysterious hand on the balustrade was thin and bony. So... I could rule out the fat butler, (laughs) the old codger, and the young man playing video games. Yes. That left only... Me. Me. (laughs) I had accidentally touched myself in the night time, and it frightened me. That wasn't the candle that I picked up off the floor. (laughs) It was my cigar. Right. Get your mind out of the gutter. Gross. And then, what was the real explanation of the face which I, which had appeared to the two ladies? Indigestion might have explained either singly, singly, singly. <clears throat> Extraordinary coincidences do sometimes occur, but it seemed too extraordinary that a couple of ladies, one old and one young, should suffer from the same indigestion in the same house at the same time and with the same symptoms. 
On the whole, I did not feel at all comfortable and looked carefully in all the cupboards and recesses, as well as under the bed before starting to undress. <laughs> sure, I've done that. Yeah. Although, usually it's because I've convinced myself that I'm living in a uh, Truman Show sort of situation. So you're looking and for I'm cameras, looking not, for cameras yeah. not ghosts or monsters. That's fair. He yeah. probably wasn't looking for cameras. They didn't exist. No. No, no, no. I'm just saying I understand that level of paranoia. Yeah. I still check to see if I can swing mirrors away from walls whenever I'm in a new place. It's not paranoia if you say it's not. <laughs> Then I went to the door, intending to lock it. Just as my hand was upon the key, I heard a soft step in the corridor outside, accompanied by a sound which was something between a sigh and a groan. (sighs) Very faint, but quite unmistakable, and under the circumstances, discomposing. It might, of course, be George. Anyhow, I decided to look and see. I turned the handle gently and opened the door. There was nothing to be seen in the corridor. But on the opposite side, I could see a door open and George's head peeping round the corner. Hello? He said. Hello? I replied. (laughs) Hello? (laughs) Hello? Was that you walking up the passage? He asked. No, I answered. I thought it might be you. Uh, Then who the devil was it? He said. I'll swear I heard someone. There was silence for a few moments. I was wondering whether I had better tell him of the fright I had already had when he spoke again. I say, just come here for a bit, old fellow. I want to speak to you. I stepped across the passage and went together into the little study which adjoined his bedroom. Look here, he said, poking up the fire, which was burning low. Doesn't it strike you that there is something very odd about this house? You mean... The preposterous corners? (laughs) Too many stairs? (laughs) Well, he said... I I, I don't know why I said... Well... (laughs) I wouldn't say anything about it to the master or Miss Stoner for fearing of frightening them. All the same, scarcely a night passes, but I hear curious footsteps on the stairs. You've heard them yourself, haven't you? Now you mention it, I said. I confess I have. And what is more, he said, I was sitting here two nights ago, half asleep, and it seems ridiculous, I know, but it's a fact. I suddenly saw... A horrible face glaring at me from between those curtains behind you. It was gone in a moment, but I saw it as plainly as I see you. I moved my seat uneasily. Did you look in your bedroom or in the passage? I asked. Yes, at once, he replied. There was nothing to be seen, but twice again that night I heard footsteps passing. Good God! Good God, man. I'm a doctor. I I like that the most obvious culprit has been written off. Mr. Carson Sr.? No. The teenage girls. Fucking around and playing pranks. Yeah. (laughs) But they don't don't have big hands. Maybe they Um, raided the refrigerator and just put cold sausages on their fingers. Ooh. (laughs) All right. There it is. That's the answer. He started up this up his he started He started up No 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 you have to finish the story like that now. Oh it's no wonder. Alright. He started up in his chair, staring straight over my shoulder. I turned quickly and saw the curtains which parted off the bedroom swinging together. What is it? I asked breathlessly. I saw it again, the same face between the curtains. I tore the hangings aside and rushed into the next room. It was empty. The lamp was burning upon a side table and the door was open, just as George had left it. In the passage outside, all was quiet. I came back into the study and found George running his fingers through his hair in perplexity. There is clearly one person too many in the house, I said. I think we ought to draw the place 
and find out who it is. And vote them off the island. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. All right, he said, picking up the poker from the fireplace. If it's anything made of flesh and blood, this will be useful. And if not, he stopped short, for at that instant the most awful shriek of horror rang through the house. A shriek of wild, uncontrollable terror, such as I had never heard before and I never hope to hear again. One moment, we stood staring at each other, dumbfounded. The next, George Carson had dashed out of the room and down the corridor to the stairs. I followed close behind, for we both knew that none but a woman in mortal fear would shriek like, shriek like that, and that that woman was Miss Stoner. Down the stairs, we tumbled pell-mell in the darkness. But before I reached the landing below, where Miss Stoner's room was, I felt as I had felt the evening before, something brushed swiftly past me. As I ran, I turned and caught at it in the dark, but my hand gripped only empty air. I was just about to turn back and follow it when a cry from George arrested me, and looking down, I saw him standing over the prostrate form of Miss Stoner. She had tripped on my pipe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <clears throat> the door of her room was open, and by the moonlight which streamed into the room, I could see her lying in her white nightdress across the threshold. What followed in the next few minutes I can scarcely recall with accuracy. The whole house was aroused by the poor girl's awful shriek. Kinky. She, <laughs> she was quite unconscious when we came upon her. Mm. But she revived more or less as soon as... You can't give consent when you're unconscious. Why are you coming upon her? <laughs> oh. But she revived more or less as soon as Mrs. Carson and one of the terrified servants had lifted her into, her into bed again. Nothing intelligible could be gathered from her, however, as to the cause of her fright. She only repeated hysterically again and again, Oh, the face! The face! When I saw I could do her no further good for the present, I took George by the arm and led him out of the room. Look here, George, I said. We must find out the reason of this at once. I am certain I felt something go by me as I came downstairs. Now, does the staircase lead anywhere but to our rooms? George considered for a moment. Yes, he replied. That was a great acting beat. <laughs> Thank you. There is a door at the end of the passage which leads up into a sort of lumber room. Then we'll explore it, I said. For my part, I can't go to sleep until I've got to the bottom of this. Get the man to bring a lantern along. The butler looked as though he didn't half like the enterprise, and to tell the truth, no more did I. It was the uncanniest job I ever undertook. However, we started, the three of us. First of all, we searched the room on the floor above, where George and I slept. Everything was just as we had left it. Then I pushed open the door at the end of the corridor. A crazy-looking staircase led up into darkness. We went cautiously up. I first with a candle, then George, and last of all the butler with a lantern. At the top, we stepped into a big, rather low room with beams across the ceiling and a rough, uneven floor. Our lights threw strange shadows into the corners, and more than once I started at what looked like a crouching human figure. We searched every corner. There was nothing to be seen but a few old boxes, a roll or two of matting, and some broken chairs. But in the far corner, George pointed out to me a rickety ladder which led at a closed trap door. Just then, I distinctly heard the curious, half-groaning, half-sighing sound which had already puzzled me in the corridor below. We stood still and looked at one another. We all heard the sound. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's up there, I said. The question is, who is going up? George put his candle down upon the floor and stepped upon the ladder. It cracked beneath his weight. He stopped. <laughs> I don't know that I was ever in such a queer funk 
as I was while I slowly mounted that ladder. Would that be a Funkin 7-8? Yes. Maybe. Probably not. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Yeah. And pushed open the trap door. I had formed no clear idea of what I expected to find there. Certainly, I was not prepared for what happened. For no sooner was the trapdoor fully open than there fell, literally fell, upon me from the darkness above a thing in human shape, which kicked and spat and tore at me as I stood clinging to the ladder. It lasted but a moment or so, but in that moment I lived a lifetime of terror. The ladder swayed and cracked beneath me, and I fell to the floor with the thing gripping my throat like a vice. The next instant, George had stunned it with a blow from the poker and dragged it off me. It lay upon its back on the floor, a ragged, hideous, loathsome shape, and the mystery was solved. Just like that. End of story. <laughs> no. But you haven't told us what it really was, said one of the listeners. The doctor smiled. It was the owner of the house, he replied. He had not gone abroad. He had gone to a private lunatic asylum with homicidal mania with homicidal mania upon him. <laughs> about a fortnight <laughs> Jesus. About a fortnight before this, he had managed to escape and, having made his way to his former home, had concealed himself with con with a cunning often shown by lunatics in the loft. I suppose he had found enough to eat in his nightly rambles about the house. The only wonder is that he didn't kill someone before he was caught. The end. I like it. I and, like it. And the moral of the story is, ghosts aren't real. They're just homicidal lunatics. Yeah. So don't worry, kids. There isn't a monster under your bed. It's just your dad. It's just the murderer who, who <laughs> used to live there. It's just your landlord. It's just your landlord. <laughs> it's not a ghost. Your landlord just wants to kill you. But we already knew that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Is that the best moral? Everything is about sex. Freud would agree with you. Yeah. Don't lose your pipe. Are we good with that one? Yeah, I'm good with that. All right. I, I like how many of how many of like the ghost stories of this era are, are like all build up and then one confrontation at the very yeah. end. Well, as, as opposed to like modern horror stories where it's like the confrontation is kind of like ongoing. Yeah, I think an ongoing confrontation is easier to do when you can see what's happening. It's easier in in film. That's fair. To uh to keep that engaging. Whereas when you're reading, like it it's the the build of tension, the what is it, the mystery that that adds. But then also just the style of storytelling has changed through the years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was fun. I like that one. Hey listeners. Uh so we've already agreed that you are going to send us pictures of your creepy haunted or maybe just fine objects from your house and give us a little story about it but the other thing i want to know is do you have any ghost stories that either you still don't have the answer to or that you realize yeah, it was a raccoon um or eh, it was just my landlord trying to kill me or whatever like you you came up with the with the non-supernatural uh solution uh, I, yeah, I want to I want to hear what ghost stories you've experienced. Uh, so shoot both of those things or either of those things to 5050 arts production at Gmail dot com or message them to any of our social media accounts. You can find Campfire Classics podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those things. Um, I have temporarily been left in charge of all of our social media. So. I'm not very good at being interesting, but at least I have all the passwords now and I can respond to you if you send us messages. So go ahead and do that. Do you have any uh, ghost stories that that like are remain unsolved or turned out to be something really? Yes, I do. Uh, so this this actually happened in the house where we grew up. 
um, it was, I may have told this story on the podcast before. I don't know. Um, it was late at night, like three thirty, four 4 a.m., something like that. And I woke up to this horrifying, like pounding and grinding sound coming from the direction of, of the, the stairs that led to the front door of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, and was, was genuinely terrified that there was either like some sort of gremlin trying to claw its way up through the cement floor of the basement or a, a like chainsaw murderer trying to get through our front door. Right. This went on for, um, it was probably only like five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, but it felt like three hours. Like it felt like it was going on forever. And I was terrified. Um, and I wanted to know what it was, but I was too afraid to get out of bed. Uh, so when it finally stopped, I like, I stayed in bed staring at the ceiling for a while and eventually I fell asleep, woke up the next morning, still alive. I had not been murdered by a gremlin or a chainsaw murderer. Clearly. Yeah. Uh, but then I went to bed the next night and right about the same time, the same thing happened. Um, like. Did, did you ask mom and dad about it? No. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, I don't remember why. I, well, so the reason why is because I was like 12 or 13. Like, I felt like I was too old to be scared by weird noises in the night. Right. Um, that in daylight, I was like, oh, well, yeah. What, like, houses make weird noises. It's not that big a deal. Whatever. Um, but then the same thing happened the next night. And then the same thing happened the next night. Um, but by the third night, I was like ready for it and waiting for it. And I was starting to get a sense of the timing of it. I was like, okay. It's coming from exactly the same place. The sounds are very repetitive. It's not moving. So the third night I got out of bed and I walked out and um, the way our house was set up, there was a, a stairway under the door that had a little uh, leading to the front door that had a little like little doorway crawl space underneath it. And it led to the um, the the closet in the back of the bathroom that is where like the hot water heater and the hot water softener and everything were. And I followed the sound to that closet, like between the bathroom and the staircase and discovered that it was just the sound of either the hot water heater or the water softener, like kicking on. It would do its major boot at three o'clock in the morning so that it, so that, you know, during the day when people needed hot water or soft water or whatever it was, we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to wait for it to go through right, the, right. the whole system changeover. So it was just like the water processing underneath yeah. the stairs. It's wild. It's wild to me that like, cause, cause that, you know, that, that had been there for a while, presumably like doing that. So it's like interesting that like there was just one, one night that it really woke you up and then, and then kept doing that. Yeah. I think it likely that it was one night that, um, you know, I was having weird dreams and sleeping light or woke up or whatever. Yeah. Um, it also, it wasn't the one that had been there for years because at some point we, uh, replaced it. We replaced it. Yeah. So I don't think it was the first night with that new system, but it was, you know, a year or two old at that point. So it hadn't been doing it for ages right so listener please share your version of that story <laughs> uh and uh and any um possibly haunted objects you might have with us and when you shoot us those messages to either the email address or social media that i've already repeated a couple of times here uh please include this week's secret passcode which is another man's pipe Woo. uh that's it for me you got any parting words Merry Christmas. And until next week, <laughs> this has been Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. Or floor. Yeah, on a, like a plank in between two yeah. cinder blocks. I turned that into a shelf a couple of times. Yes, me too. Yeah. that I think is going to sound great. What? Silhouettes in 7-8. The melody works perfectly. Took a walk on past your house Late last night All the shit
shades were pulled and drawn Way down tight, wondering why I'm not the guy Whose silhouette's on the shade, oh what a lovely couple they make Huh, it works really well I like that, yeah Alright, well, that's recorded, <laughs> we'll see if it makes it into the cut <laughs> That was a really important sidetrack Alright all sidetracks are important.